to stand as we honor the Word of God this morning. Acts chapter 2. Verse number 41. Acts chapter 2. Verse number 41. And they that were gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted unto all men, as ever man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. This morning... We have certainly called this I Love My Church Sunday. One of the grand things I get to do is talk about the church. Church has taken a lot of hits down through the ages and down through time, but uh, it is a God-sought institution, a God-bought institution, and I believe sometimes we need to pause and remember the church. Let me give you this right quick. The story is told of a manager of a minor league baseball team who became completely disgusted with his center fielder's performance. From where he sat in the dugout, all he saw was a lot of running around and miscatches, activity, but not much productivity. The center fielder always seemed to have faded to the wrong side of the field, but not having any effect. The manner of, the manager eventually ordered the player to the dugout and assumed the position himself. The first ball that came his way took a bad hop and hit the manager right in the mouth. The next hit was a high fly ball to center, which the manager lost at the glare of the sun. It bounced off his forehead. The third ball that came his way was a hard line drive that he charged violently, only to have the ball soar above his outstretched glove. At that, the manager ran back to the dugout, grabbed the center fielder by his uniform, and shouted, You've got center field so messed up that even I can't do a thing with it. Sometimes we have the church so messed up that maybe we just need to pause and let's see what God can do with it. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, how we have prayed and labored this week. Father, we've prayed diligently that you'd be in this service. Lord, not because of us, but because of your holy name. Because you are king of all kings. You're high and lifted up. And certainly you are worthy to be praised. Father, just for the few brief moments we have this morning, I would pray that you would walk in everyone's heart and everyone's life. Father, I pray that this message would have a lasting impact, not only on me, but all who adhere. Father, we thank you what you do in advance. God, hide me from self and sin. Cleanse me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Someone once said this of Socrates. He was considered wise, not because he knew all the right answers, but because he knew how to ask the right questions. If you are like most people, you have some questions that you would like to know. Some of your questions would no doubt produce some amazing truths. A man by the name of Dr. Gregory Stock has written a book that contains 275 thought-provoking questions, and the title of the book is called The Book of Questions. I knew you knew that, but, but let me give you a sample of some of the questions, and these will be on the screen this morning, some of the questions that... Uh, uh, that he posed in, in, in this book. Number one, if you were to die this evening with no opportunity to communicate with anyone, what would you most regret not having told someone? And the question is, 
Why haven't you told them yet? Number two, you discover your wonderful one-year-old child is because of a mix-up at the hospital, not yours. Would you want to exchange a child to try to correct the mistake? I know what you're thinking. It depends. I know. No, it don't depend. Your house containing everything you own catches fire. After saving loved ones and most importantly your pets, you have time to safely make a final dash and save one item. What would it be? And here's something that maybe you need to consider. Number four. While parking late at night, you slightly scrape the side of a Porsche. You are certain no one is aware of what happened. The damage is minor and would be covered by insurance. Would you leave a note? The story is this actually happened and not only did it actually happen, that somebody saw this actually happen. And they saw this this, this, this thought-provoking individual scrape the side of a vehicle and he did sketch a note and everybody saw him and thought, that's an honest man. And he put the note under the windshield wiper and left. And everybody naturally assumed that he wrote his name and address and his insurance. But the fact of the matter is, he wrote on the note, he says, Everybody thinks I am writing my insurance number, but I'm not. And stuck that underneath the windshield wiper. Now certainly no one here would do that, I understand that. Not only are there some questions, but certainly for you and I, there are some why questions. Things that have occurred to you or some close family members that this simply did not make sense. Things in life that you wondered if God was there during those painful times. And believe it or not, there are some of those why questions in the Bible. And some of, uh, some of uh, the things we go through are some of life's most difficult challenges. Our generation is not the first to experience some very difficult times. Let me give you several why questions that's in the Bible. Number one, God asked Cain, why are you so angry? Moses asked himself, why did the bush not burn up? And Job asked the Lord, why did I not die at my birth? But there's another big why question, and this is where we're going to get to the rest of the message this morning, and it is this. And it's a very important question, and I want to pose your, uh, your mind and get your mind settled and wrapped around this. Why has the church been called into existence? What does a, why does a church occupy a place in our city? Why are some sermons preached and why do we send missionaries around the world? In other words, why do we do what we do each Sunday? Now to some of you, here's your response. Well, because we don't have anything else to do, we need to blow an hour and this is why we... No, there's more to it than just occupying your time. I hope you understand this. Let me give you a list and certainly if, if you need this after service, every church in America, I'm, I'm telling you, Every church and every pastor in America needs these statements. It's fixing to be up on the screen this morning. And I trust that you get this. But not only did I need this, and it's something that's been in my books, it's something that I've uh, uh, encountered many years ago, but I've come back to these statements over and over and over, and I want to share these with you. Number one, let me show you this. The first statement, and listen to this, statements that talking about ministry, number one, I, there it is, the foundation of ministry is character. Think about this. Everything we do, my friend, has to evolve around character. Number two, the nature of ministry is service. My friend, listen to me. We're not here just to occupy time. We're here to be service and be the hands and the feet of our King, Jesus. Number three, the motive of ministry, I hope you understand this, is love. Now listen to me, we have a false conception of love, but can I tell you this, if we can't love everybody in this room this morning, I'm going to submit to you, then some of us have got deep problems. Number four, the measure of ministry is sacrifice. Amen. Some of you, listen, I understand this, and we're not talking about just financial, but I'm talking about time and talents and Usually, friend, listen to me. Usually we don't near sacrifice for the for the Lord Jesus like I believe He calls us to do. Now you can't amen that, by the way, because we are way too comfortable in our Christianity. The authority of ministry is submissiveness. 
The purpose of ministry, listen to this, is the glory of God. Everybody look up here. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God. Everything we do here this morning and everything we've done this week is not self-seeking, my friend. It is for God's eternal glory. The tools of ministry are the word of God and prayer. The privilege of ministry is growth. And it doesn't mean just numbers, but it means personal growth as well. And the power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And look at this. The model of ministry is Jesus Christ. Friend, I don't know about you, but each and every one of us need those 10 object lessons or these 10 steps of ministry that you need to see and I need to see as well. Now think about something as we get into this. In the early stages of the book of Acts, there were thousands of believers with no buildings to meet in, no pastor, no direction, no knowledge of the Christian life, no church constitution, and the Bible was not yet complete. And basically at the early point, they had nothing that we would consider as a church. But I'm going to show you something this morning that just blew me away that I knew that you needed to see and I needed to see as well. Yet these early founders, our early disciples, and these men that just came encounter with Jesus Christ, they came up with a system. They came up with some things that were so unique for their time and so unique for us today that I knew that you need to see those this morning. As a matter of fact, you needed them and you needed them and you needed them and you needed them. Friend, can I tell you, these are not only unique for their time, watch, but they'll work today. Let me show you an acronym. It'll be on the screen this morning. They came up with this four keys for church. And it's all with the word wife. So if you don't get anything out of this morning, here's what you can go. And somebody says, what did you learn at church? Well, we learned about wife. All right. So that's what you could get. Here's what they come up with. Here's what your early apostles. Here's what your early church founders came up with. Look at this. W stands for worship. I stands for instruction. F stands for fellowship. And E stands for expression. Did somebody get that this morning? This is a this is a this is a structure that these men came up with, and they said this: if we're going to start and, and if we're going to begin something called the church, and, and if we're going to get a body of believers to go, we've got to have some kind of system. We've got to have something in mind. And they developed this. And Frank, can I tell you, I was just blown away when I saw this, and I thought, man. My goodness, this would be something that we as Calvary Baptist Church ought to look at this morning. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42, first of all, we'll talk about worship. Notice what it says. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, and watch this, and in prayers. Their worship was not some manufactured, half-hearted effort. It was a full-blown worship by all. There was an awesome response of God's presence. Listen to me. It was a time of unrestrained joy. Everybody look up here. Now, I was going to do this this morning. I was going to have everybody look like your unrestrained joy, but I didn't think some of you could do that, all right? Some of you hadn't even woke up yet, and it's dark and cool, and you've got to do all these things. I get that. But in the early church... They had joy of purpose. Here's what they figured out. Look at this. We have figured out that we're going to worship Jesus Christ. We're going to, listen, and we don't care what the authority says. We don't care about the Caesars and the Herods and all of these madmen. We're going to worship because Jesus died for us. And there is a sense of purpose and there's a sense of joy. And they worshiped in their heart and in their life. Listen to me, let me submit something for you very quickly. In the modern church, we have programs, but we have no worship. We can meet on time, but we have no worship. We have people, we have no worship. We have signs and facilities and all of these things to try to make people engage, but we have... 
it's sad. When we come to the church, that we come and we just sit. <sighs> what is this guy going to do today? Good gosh. Don't he know that I'm already hungry? And I'm sure I'm going to miss the first kickoff. And goodness gracious. Wait a minute. I cannot see that the Peters and the Johns were worried about a kickoff. They worried about pleasing Jesus. They saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw him do miracles. They saw him cure. They saw him do some incredible things. And they didn't even understand it. And they didn't even get it when he died on the cross because they all fled. But after the cross, after the resurrection, there was joy that was born in their heart. There was praise that came from their lips. And they were cascaded, cascaded by the authorities. And they were thrown in prison. And they had their feet in stocks. But they still praised God. Friend, I don't know about you, but we don't even do that today. We come into the church and we're half-hearted about it. We don't even come prayed up, ready up, and ready to praise Him. If somebody sings a song, oh well. Somebody gives a testimony, it's, it's on my time, preacher. Friend, listen to me. We've got to get to the place in our service, in our place, where worship ought to be primary. God help us when we come into church. And it means nothing to us anymore. God help us when we come to church and our hearts are hardened by the world and we're more worried about a kickoff than we're worried about the blood of Jesus. God help us. They had worship. Unrestrained. Worship. Not only did the W stand for worship, but the I stands for instruction. In Acts 2.42, you see the word doctrine. It simply means biblical instruction. It was simply the message that they molded the church around. Everybody look up here. It was simply the message of this, that Jesus walked and He taught and He lived a perfect life. But then He died upon the old rugged cross and then He was buried and three days later He came again and they formed the church around that doctrine right there. And friend, can I tell you, that doctrine today still goes completely around the world and it is still as vital today as it was then. Instruction. Friend, listen to me. We come into the church not just simply just to get in our place and not just simply just to meet to meet, but friend, we come with instruction in mind. I don't know about you, but when I come to church, I want God to speak to my heart. I want God to do a regeneration and a closeness. I want to feel the breath of God upon my neck every time I come into church. But I do that through instructions from the Word of God. Sadly, today, many are content with the syrupy, shallow, candy-coated sermonettes what you may not be aware of, and it is this. A well-fed sheep are much more able to stand under the continuous battles and trials of life. If I look up here, just act like you're interested today. A well-fed sheep, when things come your way, you're going to know, hey, the preacher preached on this, or I read this in the Scripture, or when I was praying, God gave me instruction, and I know that I can overcome. I know God's on the throne. I know that I can get through this. I don't want to go through it. But God is my shepherd, and He'll not leave me. Amen. They grew. They were instructed. They placed an emphasis on teaching. Did you realize this? Look, the Bible says they went house to house. Why? To teach. This was a brand new thing come upon the scene. And the disciples understood this. We watched Jesus and we saw His life and and people need to be encountered. People need to understand. And people need to know His words. So they went daily instructing people in Christ. Now, we've got the... We'll get ugly. Go watch. Now we've got to beg and plead people just to come to church. 
we got to do everything. We got to we got to do all of these things just to get people interested. Friend, listen to me. This ought to be the highlight of my week to come and understand that I can put my cares and my thoughts and all of this stuff away just for a few minutes and I can encounter God's love and encounter God's goodness. And I ought to want to run to the house of God. But sadly, we have too much on our plates and too many things demanding our time. In the summer of 1805, a number of Indian chiefs and warriors met in the council of Buffalo Creek, New York to hear a presentation of the Christian message by a Mr. Cram from the Boston Missionary Society. After the sermon, a response was given by Red Jacket, one of the leading chiefs. Among other things, the chief said these words, Brothers, you say that there is one way to worship and serve the Great Spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not all agree And as, as you read that same book? Brother, we are told that you have been preaching to white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We are acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find it does them good, makes them honest, and less disposed to cheat, we will then consider again what you have said. Powerful words. Don't you think that the Scriptures are to change our lives? Don't you think the teachings of Jesus Christ are to make a difference in our behavior, in our attitudes, and in our actions? The early church couldn't get enough of instructions. The question to you is, what about you? We've already seen how worship instruction was huge in the early beginning of the church. Now, quickly, let's notice the third truth, and that's the F in the WIFE acronym, and it stands for fellowship. The early church had a closeness of fellowship rarely found today. Are you still with me this morning? In Acts 2.42, the verse says something amazing. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Not just a prayer or teaching, but fellowship. They came together for a common good and a common cause. Persecution pushed them together, but fellowship kept them together. What you find in church when it comes to fellowship can't be duplicated by the world. When you are part of the church, you are part of lives, a part of helping others to make it through. You weep with one another, you rejoice, and you get to bear one another's burdens. Today we think of a church fellowship as a huge table laden down with our favorite foods. But it involves much more than a banquet table. It involves sharing our battles and allowing others to enter our personal space. We simply, at the church, we care for one another. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. At the church, we simply care for one another. You're part of something that can't be duplicated by the Lions Club, the Gowanus Club, all of the clubs in Mule Shoot, Texas. You can't get what you can get here out there. And many of you are trying to duplicate the church. And if you was just part of the church, you could do something wonderful. Wow, I just don't understand that. We try to manufacture the things that you get at church out there. And what God says, why don't you just give the church a try? Why don't you just get involved? And and, 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 and let me challenge you with something. Why don't you try a Sunday night? You just might like it. Why don't you come on a Wednesday night when, when you can and you should? Why don't you just give it a try? <laughs> you know we can't do that. Mercy. My goodness. With what Jesus done for us. And we can't give him a Sunday night. Or Wednesday night. Marion Jacobson, in his book called Saints and Snobs, writes something so unique. And when I came across this, I thought, oh my goodness. Now, let me read it. Are you ready? 
if any group of Christians who claim to believe and practice all God that all God has said in His book will face up to their personal responsibility within the family of Christ and to the real needs of Christians around them, their church will impress its community with the shining goodness of God's love to them and among them. Such a transformation probably would do more to attract others to Jesus Christ than any house-to-house canvas or campaign or new church facility. God, listen to this, people are hungry for acceptance, love, and friends. And unless they find them in the church, they may not stay there long enough to become personally related to Jesus Christ. People are not persuaded, they're attracted. We must be able to communicate far more by what we are (laughs) than what we say. Did somebody get that? Church. If we could understand that then people are searching for such a place, a place where each is accepted and free to share their spiritual gifts as we serve Jesus Christ. I want to give you a purpose verse that each and every one of us are to memorize by heart. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what it says. This is the purpose. This is the purpose of the church and for you and for me. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. Do all. If you have your Bibles open this morning, you might want to underscore that word. All. To the glory of God. All. That means when you're out in a community and speaking to people or when you're at your house or wherever, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, whatever you're thinking, the Bible says our purpose statement for the church in our purpose statement for your life, my purpose statement ought to be whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. Amen. All. 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 Let me ask you this. Is your communication part of all? Is your communication part of all? Somebody says, yes. Yes. It is part of all. What about your thinking? Is that part of all? Yes. What about your goings? Is that part of all? Yes. What I'm telling you, here is what the Apostle Paul was trying to get for you to understand and for me to understand. It is everything you do or to bring glory to the Lord's name. The fourth thing and last thing in the life acronym is the word expression. In the second chapter of Acts, these folks were compassionate, caring, and especially when it came to the art of giving. In Acts chapter 2, in verse number 45, it says, And they sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as ever men had need. These early Christians had expressed interest to the needs of others and especially to the sweeping, this new sweeping organization called the church. This new thing called church was contagious And it was courageous. Everybody look up here. Let me give you this. Now, you've come to this point and some of you are saying, so what big deal? Well, I'm fixing to give you so what big deal. And it's this. In the early church when all of this was beginning and the apostles was teaching and they were trying to establish churches in every locale and in every city and every vicinity and they were trying to get people and trying to see people saved. Here was the big deal. During that time, they were under harsh Harsh, harsh persecution. Just to mention this new thing called Christianity or or this man called Jesus could get you locked up, get you beheaded, or put you put in a prison for life. You see, what they did under what these people did there, they understood this. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. It is worth the price I have to pay. In the year 2013, here's our thinking. It is worth as long as it don't cost me nothing. And as long as we don't have to do nothing. And be nothing. When a church was beginning, the Apostle Paul could have never envisioned where the church has become right now. Where we are right now. Does somebody understand what I'm talking about? 
he could have never understood. You see, we took we take more pride in facilities than we do salvation to the lost. We take more pride in looking the part than being the part. We take more. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have a self-centered ministry. And Paul came on the scene and says, No, 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 it's not about us. It's not about anything. Let's just serve Jesus and make Him known to the world. Amen. The church, they express their love and concern one another inside their building. The church is meant to be lived launched and loved. Jesus is in the ranks of humanity and He calls out for Himself a people who would adhere to His teachings and glorify His name. Because many today have pulled out of this wonderful organism called the church, you need to belong to it. Somebody, look, watch. You need to belong to a church. Wait a minute. Each and every one of us Need to belong to the church. Let me give you six things. Here's what the church can do for you. Notice this. The church gives stability to your faith. Now watch this, watch this. Don't dismiss this. Let me give you this. Beloved, can I tell you something about this? I heard this recently. We'll just stay home and we'll have house church. Let me tell you how long that's going to last. Maybe one weekend. The church, the corporate body of believers, gives stability to your faith. When about the time you think you can't do it, then somebody comes and shakes your hand or hugs your necks and says something like this. I've been praying for you. And I don't know about you, but I think you can do it. I know it's tough. But can I tell you this? Let's just get over here in the corner and pray. Let's just see what God does. And not only that, there's people here at the church that have met countless of people's needs in the community. It stabilizes our faith. Look at number two. Look at this. It props us up in times of testing. Can I tell you this? If Jesus Christ was tested, can I tell you? You're going to as well. And I want to tell you, have you ever gone through that period of life when it just seems like it never stops. You come to church and you hear a word or you hear a song or you hear a testimony or you hear somebody and you're thinking when you leave, that is just exactly what I needed for that time period. Do you think that's an accident? No, it's a Holy Spirit saying, look, you get what you get here at the church at no other place. It props you up in times of testing. When you feel like you're about to go under church is there to prop you up. Number three, look at this. It enables you to handle the Bible correctly. You see, when you come to church, and that's the reason why we encourage you to bring your Bible so you can mark your Bible. And, and so when some of those questions come, you can understand and say, look, we, 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 we saw this in Sunday school or we saw this on Wednesday night and the preacher talked about that or the Sunday school teacher mentioned this and I just read this in the Bible. So the church helps you to handle God's Word correctly. Look at the next one. Equips us to detect and confront error. Make no mistake, friends. There are a lot of errors out there and if you do not know the word of God, you can be swept under and you can be pulled under like a riptide. Can I tell you, the church helps us to confront error. Number, next one, look at this. Look at this. It makes us confident in the law. What we're doing and what we're saying and what we're teaching is absolutely vital to this community and vital to my own personal life. And I need this in my own heart so I can be confident in my Christianity, so I know that I'm not in it all alone, so I know there are other people praying for me, so I know that when the battles come and the tests come and all of the filth of the world come my way, I could pick up the phone and call the preacher or call a brother or sister in Christ and just simply say, will you pray for me? Wow, that's great. You can't get that.
Chuck Swindoll writes this story. This comes from a true story of a young minister in Oklahoma who went to this little church in hopes of reviving the ministry. He had stars in his eyes and great hope for the future. He thought he could turn it around, and he gave it his best effort and his best shot week after week after week to no avail. Finally, he had one last idea, and it seemed to work. He announced in the local newspaper on Saturday that the church had died. And on Sunday afternoon, there would be a funeral service at the church itself, and all who wished could attend to see this funeral service for the church. For the first time in his years there, the place was packed. And in fact, people were standing outside on tiptoes, looking through the windows to see this most unusual funeral service for a church. To their shock, because most of them got there 20 or 30 minutes early to get a seat, there was a casket down front. And it was smothered with flowers. And he told the people as soon as the eulogy was finished, they would pass by and view the remains of the dearly beloved that they were putting to rest. They could hardly wait until he finished the eulogy. He slowly opened the casket, pushed aside the flowers, and the people walked by filed one by one to look in and leave sheepishly feeling guilty as they walked out the door because inside the casket he had placed a large mirror. As they walked by, they saw the reason why the church had died. Let me ask you a personal question this morning. If everyone cared for the church like you did, would the church be closed or would the church be open for business? You see, God called and bought the church with His precious blood. And it is a very, very high price. A city full of churches, great preachers and lettered men, grand music, choirs and organs. If these fail, what then? Good workers, eager, earnest, who labor hour by hour. But where, oh where, my brother, is God's almighty power? Refinement, education, they want the very best. Their plans and schemes are perfect. They give themselves no rest. They give the best of talent. They try their uttermost. But what they need, my brother, is God the Holy Ghost. The church. The church. Your choice today is to join it or to shun it. You have a rare treat today to become part of something so valuable and unique that Jesus died for it. Brother Chris, if you would go back to that acronym and show it back on the screen. And look what the early church decided. It was worth the cost. Worship. Instruction. Fellowship. And expression. This, my friend, is why these men died and gave their blood so that we could be here in Calvary Baptist Church this morning in the year 2013. Somebody, are, are you still clued in with me a little bit? Church. The church. How valuable is the church to you? To you. To you. To you. I'd hate to think that when I got to heaven, God would simply ask me a question and say something like this. Why? Why did you forsake the church? I give you pastors. I give you a beautiful facility. I give you worship. I give you the word of God. I gave you everything you needed to be successful in life, but you just thought somehow there was something better. God help us. Father, I pray this morning, God, that we would love what you love. we would find, Lord, that what we're looking for is inside these walls this morning. 
the care and the compassion where we can meet you week in and week out. Share our burdens and share our thoughts and know that you're God of God and Lord that you would reign over all. One day, Father, and it could be soon that you're going to take us out of this old filth. But you said that you was going to take the church, the people. Father, I wonder who would say, I want to be a part of the church. I want to work here and love here and minister here. Father, who would say, I need to be a part of this place called the church. Father, I only I honestly believe this is the message you want to preach for this hour and for this time. Maybe there's somebody in this room that had been thinking about it or really contemplating their obligation to the church. And they want to come and say, Preacher, it's time for us to be a part of the church. We know it's important. We know we need it in our lives. Or maybe there just need to be some that would say, Preacher, I've never truly, honestly been saved or baptized or worked in the church. My, my commitment is not near where it needs to be. Years ago, you were growed up in the church. Maybe some was saved in the church. You were baptized in the church. You were married in the church. But since that time, your commitment is not what it ought to be. Oh, God help us. God help us not lose what you have given us. What so much blood has been shed for in the past. What so many men and women have said, I'll stake my life on this institution and I'll give it all so that we can have what we have today. The church is so vital in our communities and so vital in our personal life. Please, dear Jesus, let it be so today. Send your conviction all around the room. Father, I pray as Christians will come and pray for the church. Come and pray for one another. Pray for the lost we would see a great outpouring of your spirit this morning. As we stand quietly and reverently all over the room, may you move us to action. May our feet not be content. May we come and give you praise and glory and honor.